Psalm 119, verses 97 to 104. 97 to 104. So this psalm, this is a really simple psalm about, about how we should love God's word and the fruit it should produce in our life. So very simple, very good. A lot of deep stuff here. A lot of deep stuff that a lot of people who write really big books don't seem to don't seem to understand sometimes. So here it is. Um, I love your instruction. I think about it constantly. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies because it is always with me. I have greater insight than all my teachers because I contemplate your laws. I have more understanding than the elders because I guard your precepts. I haven't set my feet on any evil path so I can make sure to keep your word. I haven't deviated from any of your rules because you are the one who has taught me. Your word is so pleasing to my taste buds. It's sweeter than honey in my mouth. I'm studying your precepts. That's why I hate every false way. So. I don't know anybody like that. Yeah, I know it's Psalm 119. Can you tell me the verse again? 97 to 104. Okay. All right. Now leave the cat alone. No, the cat went. I, uh, as the now, cat now the cat's, cat's trying the to cat kill. The cat went to me and she was singing on me that I was now, like moving and then she killed She was being sweet. Well, now he's trying to attack a tennis shoe. So, okay. All right, let's pray for the cat. Cat sanity. And for us. Dear Lord, we come to you today in Jesus' name. Help us to love your word and love you like the psalmist does and help your word to shape us and to change us and to um, move us to live the kind of life that we see the psalmist wanting to live. In Jesus' name we pray. <coughs> All right. So this is what it says. Verse 97 sort of sort of sums up what he his main his main point and the rest of the psalm the rest of this this section uh, sort of goes along that same theme he loves god's law his instruction and thinks about it constantly it's something that's always with him it's something that informs how he lives his life it's something that that's sort of, that, that's always with him it's not just an appendage that that's duct taped to his life god's law god's word is something that's that's always with him. And verses 98 to 100 are him explaining what it does for him. He says in the first one, your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies because it is always with me. So God, he, what, he's saying, what he seems to be saying is that God's word makes him wiser, has, has, makes him have more wisdom than anyone else he ever deals with because it's always with him. It saturates his life. It's something he reads all the time. It's something that he thinks about and it makes him wiser than his enemies. Even if you don't have a lot of, even if you're not someone who's high, who's you know highly educated or who doesn't have a doctoral degree or some other nonsense, you can have a lot of education, still be really a real, a really foolish person. Um, there's a difference between education and wisdom and they're not always the same thing. Have you, have you guys met someone before who has lots of degrees, but is really dumb? Or have you ever, I mean, just because you have degrees doesn't mean you're intelligent. You, it doesn't mean that you, you're a wise person. It means, you can, it means you're probably in debt and you can persevere through a course of study. That doesn't actually mean you're a wise person. So there, you know, there, there are two different things. You know, this, the, the, the wisest Christian, uh, I think of a guy at, my, at our last church who is a really, really wise Christian guy. And he never went to college. And they're, they're, well, the wisest Christians I've ever known are people who weren't educated in the world's eyes, but were just very, very wise because they were saturated with God's word. Yeah, it sounds to me that's educated and have a skill bit as far as getting along with people or treating people right. They're horrible. Yeah, yeah. And notice he, he talks about wisdom, not, yeah. not uh, intelligence. Yeah. And I, I think they're they're really different things. He's talking about wisdom. Doesn't Paul talk about this in some passage? Like the wisdom in the world is foolishness or something? Yeah, he talks about that. And he talks about how he 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 in First Corinthians he says he resolves to not preach philosophy or preach these uh, talk about highfalutin doctrines and 
you know, esoteric subjects. He just wants to talk about Christ and what Christ has done. And that might seem simple and sort of crude and stupid to the world, but he doesn't, he doesn't care. So here in verse 98, he's sort of summing up what Solomon wrote in Proverbs, where he says, the fear of, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The, the, like the most basic foundational thing you can ever do to be a wise person is to, to fear God. That's the, the basis for all wisdom at all. And enemies can be whatever they are, and it could be many things, but He's saying, because I, because your word is always with me, it makes me wiser than my enemies. And in verse 99, he says the same sort of thing. I have greater insight. I have greater insight than all my teachers because I contemplate your laws. So what is, that's really interesting. So you can have, and your translation might say something different. Does anyone else have something different that they wanted yeah, to throw on there? Yeah, mine has something different. What? Instead of teachers, like the old um, people around you that are supposed to, that are wise. He says, uh, are you wiser than my elders? Elders, okay. So what do you guys think about that? I mean, what do you think about what he's saying here? Does anyone else's translation have something different that they want to offer up? Mine just pretty much said the same thing. Um, it does has more understanding than all my teachers. Yeah, or elders, or you know, people who are, you know, who who you might you might look up to. This is really interesting. If you know God's word, your age doesn't matter. If you know God's word, you can be wiser than people who have lived twice as long as you. You can have more insight than people that have lived twice as long as you. It doesn't mean that. You know, it doesn't mean you can be arrogant and think you know everything, but what he's saying is, is that he's not boasting, but what he's saying is he recognizes that he can have more insight into people, into life, into what's really important because he has the mind of Christ. I mean, he has, he's, he, he has, he has wisdom. So he realizes that with, if he knows, the more he knows God's wisdom through his word, the more he knows than even people who've been alive 20, 30, 40 years longer than him. Because I contemplate your laws. I, I think about them. I ruminate over them. I, I want to know them. I pray and ask you to help me understand them. Uh, verse 100 says, these are, these are all sort of saying the same thing, but in slightly different ways. I have more understanding than the elders because I guard your precepts. Oh, I'll drink that one if you're one. If you're one of what? The oh, well, thanks a lot. Does anyone else have anything different in verse 100? Because it's the same thing. So I, thought, well, I understand more than the ancients mm -hmm. because they keep your precepts. Yeah. He's saying, he's saying the same sort of things, but what he says he does with God's word is slightly different in each one. In verse 98, he has this wisdom because God's word is always with him. Verse 89, he has this great insight because he contemplates God's law. Verse 100, he has more understanding because he guards the precepts. So you have three things. God's word is always with you. So we need to be doing things so that God's word is always with us and everybody's different. Maybe you need to really devote yourself to a Bible reading plan that'll work. Maybe you need to listen to the Bible in your car. You need to do something so that God's word is, is with you and it's not just some occasional thing. Like, like once a week, I, I, once a week, I treat myself and go out to lunch at Buffalo Wild Wings because I really love Buffalo Wild Wings. Right. Okay. So, but it's not always with me. It's just something I do once a week. Yeah. You know, it's not a constant thing. It needs to be less of a constant thing, actually, so I can lose more weight. But um, so maybe every two weeks, but it's, it's not always with me, even though that does sound kind of nice um, to have it always with me. But uh, God's word is not, this is not a guy who just, thinks about God and reads his word once a week. This is someone who, who orients his life somehow so that he imbibes God's word on a regular basis. It, it's always with him. And you can do that however you want, but you should find a way to do it. 
if you want to have the heart and love for God that this guy has. It's almost a summary of Jesus' life. Because yeah. that's, that's what he did. And if you think back of uh, some of the old prophets, Elijah and Elisha, didn't see too many negative things about them. You know, the, mm -hmm. they were really committed and they saw things and God did things for them. Uh, we saw Moses with that to some degree. Since he, he was the first one to break the laws. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, he literally did break the laws, bro. That's true. Maybe that's where that comes from. The, the joke I heard was, um, who is the biggest um, sinner in the Bible? And it was Moses. Because he broke the Ten Commandments. I don't know why I'm talking about that. I can't believe that. that's really bad. I know. That's really terrible. Okay. But yeah, so, so step one. Step one, so that there's three, there's three, I don't know if he's tr really trying to describe three phases, but they seem to work well. Number one is to always imbibe God's word so it's with you. Number two in verse 89 is to contemplate them. Think about what his word says. Don't just read the Bible in a rote way. Actually let it sink into your heart and think about it and engage with this, with the Bible as you read it in some way. Um, people are different. Some people like to journal. Some people like to write notes down. Some people like to underline. I underline things in the Bible when I read it because I'm weird. I even have a ruler that I use so the lines are straight because I'm weird like that. Yeah. So um, what are you saying? You can see me doing with the ruler? Is that what you're saying? No, I just said that. OCD. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what you, he do something so you're thinking about God's word. I contemplate your laws. And verse 100, I have more understanding than, than the elders because I guard your precepts. He tries to actually do it. He doesn't just make it be this academic thing that doesn't have any, that doesn't touch his heart and touch his life. I guard your precepts. And obey your precepts. Yeah, obey your precepts. Yeah. And when he says precepts, it just means your word, right? law his, his laws what he says to do oh. yeah that yeah yeah that stuff okay. verse 101 verse 101 and 102 no verse verses 101 to 103 are sort of the fruit of this devotion to god's word and i've talked about this before and jesus mentions it too james mentions it too there, there's got to be fruit if you belong to god I mean, there, there has to be fruit. It might not be the best fruit, but there needs to be recognizable fruit that this is Christian fruit. Even if it's not edible fruit, you can still see, yes, it's, it's Christian fruit. Verse 101, I haven't set my feet on any evil path so I can make sure to keep your word. This is, a, this is a, a, like a determination to walk the right way. Not that he's perfect, but he... He, he's determining because he loves God and wants to do what he says and all of these things. He wants to walk the right way. I haven't set my feet on any evil path. Verse 102 says the same sort of thing. I haven't deviated from any of your rules because you are the one who has taught me. How has God taught him? Through his word. Through his word. So this, this, this talks about the authority that scripture has. Some people who write who have written really, really long books, they talk about how, um, you know, um, they talk about how they try and say that scripture doesn't really have that much authority, but it's just, it's just um, God just speaks to us through the scripture, and scripture itself doesn't really have a, a lot of authority in and of itself, and I and other things like that. But here. In verse 102, what the guy is saying is he, he sees scripture as, as though he reads scripture and it's as though God is talking to him. I mean, he doesn't make any of these <clears throat> weird distinctions. He says, I read the scripture and you are teaching me. It's not Isaiah that's teaching me. It's not Moses that's teaching me. You know, it is Moses, but we can set Moses aside. It's really you because you're the one who gave Moses what he wrote. And so that's the way we should look at scripture. It's not, it's not Paul wrote this, Peter wrote this, they did, 
but it's God speaking to us, God teaching us through those people. When we read the scripture, we're reading God's word, literally God's word. That's what the psalmist thought. You are the one who has taught me. He didn't say Moses taught me. So that the words we're reading here are not God's word, they're about God's word. The benefits of the word. So even though we look at this as scripture and you can quote it, it's still not the word that God speaks directly, but about the word. What the word can do. That, that's that's what yeah, that's what some that's what some people would, would say. People in our tradition wouldn't say that. I mean, people in our tradition say we have what we have the words that God gave these men to write you know, in these in these 66 books with 40 different authors. We have the words God wanted them to write. You know, it's filtered through their personality and their own weird voice. Um, but it's it's still God's word that He gave us, and even though um, it was written a really long time ago, and even though there's uh, there's all sorts of skepticism about whether we can really know if it's if we have the same words that James wrote and that Paul wrote um, we can know but all of that we there's all this skepticism out there but what we can see from what the psalmist says is he reads God he reads the scripture and he filters away Moses and, and David and all the other people and just says this is God speaking to me and that's the view that we should have when we read Anything in scripture, we read Matthew, we read Mark or Paul or Peter, it's God speaking to us. And we should trust that God has preserved his word and given it to us. So what we have in our hands is what is God speaking to us, even if it has Paul's name on the front. And then verse 103 really captures the love the guy has for God's word. It's sweeter than honey in my mouth. Your word is so pleasing. And the last verse talks about how God's word is supposed to shape us. Paul talks about this too. When, we're, when we become Christians, we put off our old person and we, we put on the new us. And the old person reflects the person we used to be and we belong. The person reflects who we are and reflects Jesus, who we belong to now. And that old image of us should slowly fade away, like uh, like that, uh, like in Back to the Future when Marty McFly has this Polaroid, and it's his he interacts with his old with his parents, and he starts disappearing from the picture because the future is being changed. So the old us is that photograph that's slowly fading away, and the new us is the new us as members of Christ's family. We're being made to look more like that as the old as the old us slowly fades away. And, well, and then Marty doesn't kiss his girlfriend. And so we Yeah, in this analogy, yeah, he shouldn't kiss. Yeah, his, his dad cannot kiss his mom at the fish under the sea dance. So he has to kiss not, the mom. The dad has to. But not in this analogy, not the way that I'm using the analogy. So we're disappearing. Yeah, you're disappearing. The old you is disappearing, the new you. Is, is here. Enchantment under the sea dance. It wasn't the fish under the sea dance. Anyway, <laughs> the enchantment under the sea dance. But what he says is, I'm studying your precepts. That's why I hate every false path. When we study God's word, it should change us. It should change our heart. It should change what we want. It should change what we like. So we should, we should be moving away from who we used to be so that we're the person that Christ has now made us to be. Because there was a time when the psalmist didn't hate every false path. If he didn't have God's word and have God's spirit, he wouldn't care about what God wants and he'd love to do whatever he wanted. But he's reading God's word and he's being shaped and changed to be different, slowly and slowly but surely. And all of the Bible expects that. If you're a Christian, you'll be changed. And it might take, it takes your whole life for that image to fade further, for the old image to fade further away and for the new one, for the new one to, uh, to come in. But it does go. Sometimes it doesn't go like we want it to, but, but there it is.